Let's see, ba, 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 four. that's the, that's this one. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me see what question that was again. That was, let me go back here in this and see what we were looking at. Just looking back at the questions here. Oh, vegetarians. Okay, let's see where that one is. Uh, Time Magazine. Blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Let's see, man. Where are my vegetarians? Part, it's part two. Part two. Oh, here we go. Okay, I see it now. Okay. Time to go to the duck and check 95% confidence. And what confidence can you state that fewer than 10% of Americans were vegetarians? And okay, let's take a look at that. I'm going to redo, uh, partially redo that, not completely redo it, but partially redo it. And I'm going to save, save as that, that, that paired. Okay, and let me get to Excel again. Okay, so four percent sample sizes. Uh, the PVAP PCAP was. Uh, uh, 0.04 and the size of the sample was a thousand people okay so we're going to take a look at something here we're going to calculate let's see what we have here um p cap is 0.04 okay and uh, we were going to calculate our when we calculated our t score or as actually we calculated a z score right Z was equal to, it was equal to uh, um, uh, PCAP. Let's see, what, what was Z equal to? Let me see again here what I did here. Uh, vegetarian. Uh, 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 4% said they were vegetarians. Oh, I've got to calculate my standard error. Uh, we did, we, we calculated the confidence interval here. And in order to calculate the confidence interval, we took PCAP and we added plus or minus the, the level of confidence that we wanted to have, which was 95%, the Z-score that we needed for that. I won't go back over the Z-score because we know with, with, uh, with this problem, we had sufficient sample size in both groups that we used Z instead of T. Okay. We calculated z We decided Z-score is 1.96. For an alpha is equal to 0.05, and we multiplied that by the standard error. Okay, and standard error was calculated here a little bit differently than it was for some of the other problems. And the way we calculated standard error was we said it was equal to it was equal to p cap. I'll write it out. I'll write it out first. P cap minus okay times excuse me one minus p cap. Okay, put this in parentheses, put this in parentheses, and minus, uh, oh, oops, PCAP times, I'm messing this up pretty good, PCAP times 1 minus PCAP over the sample size, which was 1,000 in this case. Okay, and I took the whole square root of that whole phrase. Okay, you have this, I'm sure, in somewhere. Uh, written out by hand in a, in, in a way that looks up. I don't want it's not actually calculated. I'm going to put a space in there so it doesn't bother me. Okay, that's the calculation that I'm doing to find my standard error, which determines what the distribution of repeated samples of size 1000 would be if we started with the sample that was 0.04, if we 
assume for a moment that that's likely to be our point estimate, the right, average uh, that we would find for all of these. Okay, so we're looking at uh, this is going to give us this is going to give us this standard error. It's going to give us a look at how this distribution, uh, how this is this, how this, how these samples might be distributed. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So I'm going to calculate this now. Equals the square root of 0.04 times 1 minus 0.04, which is 0.96, right, over 1,000, which is the sample size. I want to take the square root of this whole thing. Um, I, I, I would say thir at least 30, sample size of at least 30, uh, uh, as, uh, if you want to use a z-score for uh, a normal uh, a numerical set, numerical variable. For the p-test, got to be at least 30, but 15 in each of the two groups. Okay, so this is what I get as my standard error. Okay, I calculated my confidence interval by saying, well, two times that standard error. In other words, we added two times that standard error to the left of PCAP 0.04 and two times my standard error to the right of PCAP. Okay, well now, you know, that gives me my confidence interval for, that's really represents a range in which, in which 95% uh, 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 of my results are, 95% are, uh, probability of my mean is between those two range, those two values, and there's two and a half percent chance it's below that, and two and a half percent chance that it's above that. Well, they're asking us, well, what confidence can you state that fewer than 10 percent of Americans were vegetarians uh, in uh, 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 in in 2002? Well, let's think about that. They're asking us, what's the probability that less than 10 percent of Americans? In other words, probability. P is less than 0 0.01, okay, uh, 0.1. Well, we're kind of doing a t-test now, aren't we? We've got a standard error here, and we got a probability that we want to compare this to, 0.1, okay? So maybe I want to make set up, let's look at this from a couple of perspectives. H null, right? H null is that, um, uh, well, we want to prove that fewer than 10% of Americans were vegetarians. So what we're interested in proving is that, is that P is less than 0 0.1, 0 0.10. Okay, so our null hypothesis is, is that P is equal to or greater than 0.1. Okay, let me think about that for a second. P is equal to or greater than uh, 10 plus than 10 percent. That's and we want to reject our hypothesis. Okay, so this is basically what we want to prove. Well, we know that the calculation that we did was told us that that um, 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 uh, let's see, let's see. We know that the calculation that we did, uh, uh, the sample that we took, told us that 4% of Americans were vegetarians. Okay, I could actually say, maybe make this, I could actually turn this if I wanted to, into a, instead of a one-sided hypothesis, do something a little bit more rigorous and say that it's equal to point. Uh, try and prove that it's equal to or different than, not equal to, 10%. Okay, so I could solve this, which is a two a, a two-sided hypothesis, or I could solve this, which is a one-sided hypothesis. Okay, so I'm going to do this one first. I'm going to look at this as a two-sided hypothesis. Well, let me see. Well, I'm going to calculate a z-score here. Z because I know my sample size is big enough, it's a p-value. My z-score is going to be equal to the difference between what I calculated and what my null hypothesis is, what I want to check my null hypothesis. It's going to be 0 0.1, 0, minus 0 0.04, 0 
right? P1 minus P2. I'm just comparing the two of these, okay? And uh, I'm going to put that over my standard error. And my standard error came out to be uh, 0 0.06, 0 0.0006. So how many standard errors apart are these two fractions? Well, let's see. Well, my z-score is 9.68, so it's extraordinarily unlikely if I do a two-sided test, which is rigorous, very rigorous, that uh, 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 that uh, that I could reject my null hypothesis. That uh, uh, you know, I actually I should have done. This should have been point. You should have caught me on this. 0.04, and not equal to 0.04, and compare it uh, to uh, a, a value of 10. But if we prove this equal to 10, it will still be 8% or 6%. Well, we've proved that. Hang on a second here. That's uh, Athena, you're absolutely right that if we were doing a t-test here and we were only able to work with the t-table, all we would have been able to say, at least easily, at least directly, is that we reject the null hypothesis that it's not equal to 10% or accept it. But because we're working with something that we can actually calculate z for, we can now go back to the z-table and look up what the uh, percentage of error, what the tail is, what the two tails are for that z-score. But when we go to that z-score, you're going to see that a z-score of 9 is going to be 0 0.000000. It's going to be really tiny. So really, that question would have made more sense if we had said maybe 6%. So in that case, we're comparing 4% to 6% instead. Say 0.06. See what we get then. Well, then we get a z-score of 3.22. So if I pull up my Z table, whoops, okay, if I pull up my Z score, my, my Z table, the P for Z, the probability of getting a, that number of uh, values that are that far apart, a Z score of 3.22 or 3. 3.23, if I round it off, 3.23 is, let's see, 0, 3.20, uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, is 0 0.006. Okay, now if I'm doing a one-tail test, I would just call it 0 0.006. If I'm doing a two-tail test, I would double that and say my probability of being wrong uh, if I say uh, that uh, there's a less than 6% of the U.S. population is um, uh, uh, as vegetarian, my probability of being wrong would be 0 0.0012, or about uh, uh, 1.12%, uh, okay? Uh, why negatives? I'm not sure, why am I looking at negatives? Where'd the negatives come up? Do we mean negatives on the paired samples? Say, Marie? Oh, in the Z table. Uh, but I'm looking at, uh, remember the Z table, uh, uh, I, uh, the way that this particular Z table works is it's got negatives and positives, but it's always giving, you remember Z of zero is the mean, it's the middle value. So Z scores above are positive, Z scores below are negative. In other words, there it, it represents one standard deviation, two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, so in this case, it was just easier for me to look at the negative 3.23 because it automatically gives me one tail. If I looked at the positive 3.23 on this, uh, on this uh, uh, table, then it would have given me 0.9994, which means that that's the area to the left of that. So I would have had to subtract this one, one to get the tail. So I just automatically did the negative one because I saved the step doing that. Okay, I, you know, I hope I got kind of answered that when I stumbled over it a little bit because I wasn't quite prepared to answer it. But you get the idea that because we can calculate a z-score when we do a hypothesis test with the p-values, or if we do it with samples that are very large, because we can calculate a z-score instead of a t-score, it permits us it permits us to be able to uh, 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 calculate a real probability. I just show, want to show you one more thing. 
And what I'm going to do to show you that one more thing is I'm going to import one of these files into SPSS. Now I don't want to I don't want to save that one. Don't need to save that one. I'm going to open SPSS. I'm going to open one of these files into SPSS. Okay, bounce, bounce, bounce. Come on, start up. Bounce, still bouncing. Let me get this stuff out of the way. Uh, no, I'm going to save changes. I'm going to save changes there. Okay, here we go. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a, open one of these files. I'm going to import one of these files from Excel. Now, hopefully, if we're really going to give you something in, uh, 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 if we're really going to give you something that's going to require uh, SPSS, will no doubt give you the SPSS file. Uh, however, uh, it's it might be good to know how to do this. Uh, you can look over my shoulders. I'm doing this. Uh, let me see practice. That's this folder. I don't see the Excel files because I'm looking only for SPSS files. So I'll tell you, let me see the Excel files. So I'm going to open um, this one with uh, equal, vari equal variance. Just could it open the other one? It wouldn't make any difference. It recognizes data between A1 and B11, those two rows of 10 data, plus the top, top two rows are the words new and old. That's actually the variable name. So I'm going to leave this checked because that way it knows that the top row, that first row of data, is actually the variable name. And I'm going to go ahead and import it. So SPSS imports it, and here's the data now uh, in SPSS. So now let's assume for a moment that these are paired samples. Okay, If these are paired samples, then I can just go right up here and say, well, subject one, they scored 13 here and 12 here. They scored 17 here, four for the old stuff and 19 for the If these are paired samples, I can go right up here to analyze, go to compare means. Okay. Now notice my selections again, one sample t-test. Well, this isn't a one sample t-test yet. It's going to become one, but it isn't one yet. It's one sample t-test. That's when we would say be comparing a sample we took to a given number we want to test it against. You remember that one with the uh, factory salaries, and we had 10 salaries, and we compared it to the claim of $350, one sample. Independent samples t-test is if these two were different people, that 20 subjects, not 10 subjects, each tasting each flavor, that would that would have been a uh, 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 independent samples t-test. Instead, I'm going to call this a paired samples t-test. Okay, so it asked me to tell it, what variables are part of the pairs? So new is one of the variables, and old is the other variable. Okay, and I'm gonna, and it's gonna ask me over here, what level of confidence do I want to have? What's my alpha error? Well, 95% confidence interval represents a type one error of 0.05. If I wanted an alpha error of 0.01, I'd change that to 99%. Okay, and I'm gonna click OK, and it's gonna do the calculation for me. But it does the calculation just as we did before. The mean for the uh, uh, new stuff was 15, mean for the old stuff was 10.3. Uh, it calculated the standard deviation, it calculated standard error just as we did. And then it calculated a T-score and the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom were nine, the T-score was 2.693. And we would have looked, what we did was we looked up the T-score for nine degrees of freedom, and we decided that that was a high enough T-score to reject our null hypothesis. We looked it up critical on table. SPSS actually calculates the p-value for the actual probability of being wrong. So if we go over here to significance, that's the p-value, probability of being wrong if we reject a null hypothesis. And in, in using SPSS instead of t-critical, we're going to look at this number here and we're going to say to ourselves, is that number, that chance of being wrong, of making a type 1 or alpha error of 0.05, uh, is that number greater than that alpha error or less than? So our probability of making that kind of error is only 2.5%, not 5%. So that being less than, in other words, our p-value for our test, probability being wrong, is less than alpha, 0.05. And so we reject our null hypothesis. We say that there is a difference in the way they perceive this. 
Had we assigned an alpha of 0.01, right? In other words, a much more rigorous test, we would have failed to reject the null hypothesis if it was a two-sided test because we did not get less than 0.05. And our T-score would have been not less than our critical value of T. So that's how we use SPSS to solve the same problem. Just going to do one more now. I'm going to do the same problem now, except I'm going to look at it as two independent samples, 20, 20 subjects. So in order to do that, I'm going to take these numbers here. I'm going to cut them out of there, and I'm going to paste them down here. So now I have 20 subjects. Okay, I'm going to change this, and I'm going to change this. And instead of calling it old and new, I'm going to say that this is the uh, uh, rating. The first row is the rating. And my second row is going to be my uh, 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 subject, my uh, 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 a taste, which taste which taste they were tasting, the new or the old. And I'm going to tell it, let's see, I'm going to go back to the front here just so I can fill it in first. I'm going to tell it, see, these guys were all the new ones, so I'm going to call that one. I'm going to put all ones in here for the new. Okay, hopefully this will be done for you. And I'm going to put all twos in here for the old flavors. All right, I'm going to go back here, back to the back here, variable view. And I'm going to say, okay, well, this is a, uh, the rating is numerical, scalar or numerical. Uh, the taste is nominal, in other words, a name. And I'm going to give it values. I'm going to say one is the new flavor, and two is the old flavor. I'm going to say, okay. Okay, so when I go back here, I'll see that it's labeled new and old correctly. Now, I'm going to go up and I'm going to go ahead and do my analysis. Now I have two independent samples, each one with 10 people in it. Okay, and I'm going to go up here, do my analysis, analyze, compare means. These are independent samples, t-test, two, two independent groups, right, that tasted it instead of paired samples, not the same people. I'm going to click on this. Again, my option, I'm going to make, leave that at 95% for a, 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 a type 1 error or an alpha error of 0.05. And I'm going to say, okay, the test variable, the rating, is my test variable. That's the number that I'm going to find the mean of. My grouping variable is the test, is the taste. I'm going to tell it that I want to break that rating up, the mean, the standard deviation, into two groups. The first group I labeled one, and the second group I designated two. Okay, that's my new and my old group. That's how I would let it know what there could be more than two groups in here. Uh, T-test only compares two. So you might have had new, old, and really new, right? Maybe we had 30 subjects. You only want to compare two at a time for a T-test. So don't worry about that because later on we'll learn how we compare more than three groups, at, more than two groups at the same time. But that's a little bit in the future. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. And it does the calculation for me again. Now, it did the same calculation. The mean of the first group, new was 15, mean the old was 10.3, standard deviation 3.6, 3.5, and so on and so forth. Well, now remember before we had to make a judgment. Should I assume equal variances or unequal variances? If I'm looking at this, it sure looks like equal variances to me. It looks like that to you also, right? 3.6, 3.5, none. But in SPSS, we do an actual test for the equality of the variances. That's this first four boxes here, F, SIG, uh, 1.11, and so the actual calculation is for the statistic is 0.111. The significance, again, that's a probability, is the probability of being wrong if we reject the null hypothesis for equality of variances. What's the null hypothesis for equality of variances? Well, the null, uh, null hypothesis is that these two variances are the same. Okay, and the alternative would be that they're different. We would only reject the null hypothesis. In other, in other words, only say they're different if this p-value is less than 0.05. It's not less than 0.05, so we don't reject the idea that they're the same. And in fact, you can see they're basically the same. So what does that mean? That means this calculation that's done twice here, equal variances assumed, equal variances not assumed, it's, we don't use the bottom row here because we would have used that had this number been 
less than 0.05, and we rejected the idea that they're equal. Okay, we only use it uh, uh, if that's the case. In the case where this is greater than 0.05, as now we use, we keep assuming equal variances, and we use the top row. And the top row tells us that the t-score for this comparison is 2.9. Remember the degrees of freedom, how we calculated for equal variances was 18. And you might remember that for unequal variances, it was a ca complicated calculation. Turns out 17.995. Interesting, eh? Okay. So we go across the t-score calculation is the same. We go across and the significance, the probability of being wrong if we uh, reject the null hypothesis, our, our p-value is 0.01. And since that is less than 0.05, our tolerance for error, our alpha, we reject the null hypothesis just as we did when we did it manually uh, using a calculator or using Excel. Okay, So that's the way we would use SPSS to solve those same two problems. The only thing that we didn't do here is we didn't do the version where um, 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 you do a single sample test, but that you'll see that that works out exactly the same way, okay? except you only have one row of data there because you're comparing it to a set number. In fact, if I open this up, you'll see I put the rating in here, and I just put what I want to compare it to. Like, for instance, uh, if I wanted to compare it to the number 10, right, the, the average rating, I think, uh, that's for, this is rating for everybody. If I want to compare the rating for both old and new to 10, I would just put 10 in there for it to compare it to. Okay, so I hope that helped, and I'll try and get this posted as quickly as possible, and uh, uh, it's been recording all this time, and hopefully there won't be any technical glitches, and I won't have to do this again. And uh, so good luck on the exam, and email me with questions if you have any questions, and uh, uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow night.